Welcome everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for Chronicles of the Chernobyl Disaster with Dr. Ala Shapiro. Today's webinar will consist of a 40 minute presentation followed by 20 minutes of discussion and Q&A. My name is Cassandra Carlson. I will be running the webinar in the background. Moderating for us today is Dr. Manuela Bunano. She's an associate research scientist at the Center for Radiological Research at Columbia University. Her research interests include the effects of high dose rates, flash of radiation, and the stimulation of the immune response by different types of radiation, LET. Dr. Bunano also investigates antimicrobial applications of far ultraviolet UVC light, including prevention of surgical site infections and viral transmission. A longstanding member of the Radiation Research Society, RRS, Dr. Bunano is chair of the Education and Website Committee. She produces scientific podcasts for RRS and teaches radiation sciences to students, scientists in other fields, and the general public. She received her bachelor's in physics from the University of Naples in Italy and her PhD in biophysics from Reuters University in New Jersey. In 2016, she was awarded the Jack Fowler Award by the RRS and the University of Wisconsin. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Manuela Bonanno to introduce Dr. Shapiro. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming today. We are so excited to start this new series of webinars from the Radiation Research Society with Dr. Ella Shapiro. And this is in recognition of the 35th anniversary of Chernobyl. We are very honored to have Ella. Dr. Shapiro was one of the first physician responders in the aftermath of the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster, where she was sent to some of the most radiation contaminated areas. There she witnesses the disastrous impact of Chernobyl had on families, responders, and the whole community. Dr. Shapiro is a pediatric hematologist oncologist. She's a chemical biological, radiobiological nuclear countermeasure expert, former medical officer for counterterrorism and emergency coordinator division at the FDA. Now as a member of the NEBCO advisory board, and she's working to develop a medical countermeasure against radiation. After immigrating to the U.S., her experiences during that devastating time inspired her impactful career as one of the leading experts in medical countermeasures against radiation exposure. When I had the pleasure to meet her earlier this month, we were talking about the webinar and how we should do it, and we asked her to talk about her experience and then science. And then we were talking about the days and the times, and she said, so how many days I have? So she was serious. She wasn't joking. So this is one of two webinars of the series, because today we are going to talk about mostly her experience immediately during the aftermath of the disaster. And then in April, we will let you know exactly which day. In April, she will talk about all the science behind her, her career and all the research that she has done as a physician and as a researcher. So Dr. Shapiro, she will start with her storytelling that it's centerpiece of her book, Doctor on Call, a Ch Chernobyl responder, Jewish refugee and radiation expert that is going to be released in uh, April 27th, but it's already available for pre-order. So without any further ado, please, Ella, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am honored by the invitation that I received from the Radiation Research Society to deliver two presentations in commemoration of the 35th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. I appreciate the opportunity to share my eyewitness experience and firsthand experience 
that I will never forget. In the next 40 minutes, I am going to take you on a journey which started for me almost 35 years ago on that bright spring day of April 26, 1986. On that day, the world woke up to the worst nuclear disaster in history. I first heard of Chernobyl when my father called me early morning around 5 a.m. on April 26. He told me this dire news that a nuclear reactor had exploded near city of Chernobyl. Chernobyl, this is a map, local map, is located about a little bit over 60 miles from Kiev. And uh, the nuclear reactor unit itself was located in the city of Pripyat, which is only nine miles from Chernobyl. The first radiation was detected in Sweden, and they suspected that it came from a radioactive leakage at a power plant somewhere in the Soviet Union. My dad, for many years, has been getting the real news of what's what going on in the Soviet Union from the Voice of America and the BBC. He heard this news as about 3 a.m., the only time he could, he could receive an unjammed broadcast. The world was still unaware that parts of the reactor core had exploded. The radioactive particles or materials shattered into the atmosphere. The eruption of this reactor was the result of human error and design flaw. Radioactive products were catapulted and spread across vast part of Europe and the Northern Hemisphere. I did not pay much attention or feel concerned when my father told me about Chernobyl, since it was a little known nondescript place. I was completely unaware of this nuclear power plant in Pripyat, so close to home that soon will propel my life and my career into completely different sphere. This is a photo of Pripyat when it was built, when it was born in 1970. Pripyat was designed as a model Soviet metropolis and was built to house workers from the Chernobyl nuclear power station. The authorities repeatedly told the population that this city was made just for them and residents view this town as a paradise. They were enchanted by the modern looking buildings. Behind the buildings, there were rivers for fishing and forests for picking berries and mushrooms and roses and trees, fruit trees were growing everywhere. And this completed the image of this heavenly city. Of course, this heaven on earth ended on April 26, when the city watched the worst nuclear accident that was escalated into historic disaster. Two days after the city was deserted because of radioactive contamination and placed on the list of ghost town. After the explosion, the Soviet government did not provide any warnings and repeatedly insisted through government broadcasts that life should continue normally. The pervasive official response was to deny 
and mislead the public. And this approach was embraced by those in the highest positions down to the lowest bureaucrat. Three days after the disaster, a friend of my dad called to share some unprecedented events that he had witnessed. My dad's friend was a pilot who still was working as an engineer at the largest airport in Kiev. And he had noticed some disturbing event during the night shift on that day. Airport workers were ordered to handle a frantic scramble for flights out of the city, even as government news media repeated the reactor near the city of two and a half million people posed no threat. But the passengers of those night shifts were special and distinguished. They were communist party leaders and their family. At the same time, the general population was uninformed about the real and dangerous levels of radiation. 36 hours after the explosion, the evacuation from Prebet started. Over 1,200 buses who came from Kyiv to Prebet to pick up their passengers, and that's how the exodus began. Some of the buses returned back to Kyiv in early afternoon, but some of them did not come back to Kyiv until late at night. Families with children were waiting outdoors at Prepet for many hours. And for some of them, only when the darkness fell, the last buses started moving from Prepet to Kyiv. The evacuees had packed the essentials for three days only. Among other betrayals, the government preferred to keep the pretense of a temporary evacuation. Where did the evacuees go? Most of them arrived in Kyiv. Scared passengers from Prepet and surrounding villages were unloaded at different times and different locations. And the empty vehicles were moved to the center of the city. Next step that I will share with you seemed natural at that time, but looks horrifying now. So bus drivers rushed to the public bath to shower. They dropped radiation contaminated clothes on the floor, chairs, and shelves of the public bath. While bus drivers were cleaning themselves, a team of workers started cleaning the emptied buses with the hoses. The buses were blocking Main Street in Kyiv, right where my family happened to live. So I watch it all. Muddy water poured off the buses and streamed down the streets, forming huge ponds in the most populated areas of Kyiv. It was hot then, and toddlers and older children splashed in the contaminated waters. Evikis crowded also in the children's hospital where I worked at that time, Doctors and nurses gathered medical history on each child, performed physical exam, and then we decide where the kids will go. The choices were limited. They included hospitalization, if required. If not, the children of different ages were put together in large groups. Each group was assigned a caregiver who would accompany 
children to less radioactively dangerous area. Those kids who are between ages eight and 15 were sent to summer camps or rest houses. But the authorities of summer camps in Ukraine refused to accept children, thinking that they were contagious or they call them dirty. As a result, the children were moved sometimes more than once to a few different places and their parents lost track of them for several weeks. Days after the disaster, the medical community remained unprepared and we all desperately needed whatever relevant information could be found. The head of pediatric hematology at Children's Hospital asked me to stop at the National Medical Library in Kyiv to pick up books about human health effects of radiation. This premier library had the best current sources of medical literature in Ukraine. So I set off in search of information for a presentation that my boss wanted me to make the following day for the healthcare providers. As I walked into the library, I stared in disbelief at rows of empty shelves and display windows. A librarian explained that the library staff followed an order from the above, which was to remove every book or every journal that would contain the, world, the word radiation. And this was the Soviet government default position. No information means no panic. In parallel with this painful event, other horrific events took place around the exploded reactor unit when we found out how many pieces of radioactive debris remained on the reactor roof. Even more shocking was to learn that the robots initially used to pick up wreckages turned into fried particles. After the robots failed, people and some people called them biological robots were assigned to the task. And you see them on the roof, on the reactor roof. They have masks or face coverage. They wear gloves, but other than that, they were picking up the debris of heavy radioactive elements by their hands. Each Ukrainian volunteer received 2000 rubles, which is equal $35 to work on the roof, not more than 90 seconds. Risks and long-term consequences of radiation exposure were not mentioned, the zimeters were confiscated to conceal the true scale of the disaster. Again, this was a one of the, in that chain of the default statements that Soviet officials exercised. This time, the fear of panic was the greater than the fear of radiation. While biological robots were working on the reactor roof, the helicopters and cameramen hovered over the burning reactor. Pilots were dropping clay and dolomite to put out the blaze. The pilots and cameramen received the, at that time, an experimental Soviet drug named Indralin to protect them from radiation. Unfortunately, the drug was not effective, had quite few 
severe adverse events such as nausea, vomiting, and dramatic drop in the blood pressure. It also did not save life of those people. Um, to my knowledge, one of them was brought to Seattle, the US, uh, to the US, and died the hospital from leukemia. Now we are back to Kyiv and its vicinity, where the public learn about protection from radiation, not through the officials, not through medical personnel, but through rumors which spread rapidly. Many people, including my family, started thinking of evacuation their children. We wanted to send our, at that time, three-year-old daughter to a clean area, but I didn't know where such place might be. So very soon after the explosion, some scientists managed to get an access to the true numbers reflecting the degree of radioactive contamination. They put together a color-coded map showing the levels of radiation in different areas in Ukraine and Belarus. And this spectrum goes from angry red colors to soothing yellow. One of the neighbors of the apartment where we lived in Kyiv was a scientist with a PhD degree who worked at the Institute of Physics in Kyiv. His affiliation enabled him to smuggle from his workplace a copy of such map. We finally had a chance to see where the hottest radiation spots were in Ukraine, Belarus, and Western Russia. So a few close friends, and again, just to remind me, the spread of information from person to person was unavailable because the government watched those people who wanted to talk about this or know truth and want to convey to other people, they, they watch them. So a few friends, close friends gathered at our apartment. We all grew up in the Soviet Union and everyone learned that authorities will follow those, listen to their conversation and even put them to jail those people who just want to be truthful. From watching spy movies when we were growing up, we knew that putting the drapes, close the drapes and unplugging the landline phones will uh, keep our conversation inside the apartment. So we did that and uh, then we stood at the table and poured over the map. Realized instantly that Kiev was in a hot spot. A few days after our daughter was on her evacuation route with the, her two grandmothers to one of the close to one of the clean cities in Kiev, where we're just lucky having relatives. On May 14, more than two weeks after the disaster, the Soviet leader Gorbachev for the first time spoke openly to the public. He admitted that the explosion and fire occurred on April 26 in Pripyat but also he, it was a 25 minutes talk. At the end, Gorbachev concluded that the worst is behind us. He also used the West of telling a mountain of lies about the accident. I expect questions about this slide, by the way. As we struggled to help pediatric patients, medical personnel at the adult hospitals 
were dealing with the overflow of patients from the nuclear power station and contaminated area. They all were adult, they all were adults and many pediatricians who had not examined adult patients probably since medical school were pressed into service as a non-certified internal medicine or adult doctors and I was one of them. So my first visit to the hospital for adults was memorable. I entered the big room where eight men, all former workers from the Chernobyl power stations were staying for their evaluation and treatment. They all were middle-aged men. They looked tired and they were reluctant to make any eye contacts or talk. Then I noticed one man sitting on the corner bed holding a few sheets of paper that he folded like a book. He waved this folder to me with an inviting smile. When I approached him, my patient handed his workplace from from the station workplace protocols to me. And he said, this is our manual, which we had at the nuclear power station at Chernobyl. We had to read it before we accept any job there. One of our favorite recommendations in that manual was that in radiation emergency, we should, and he paused, he looked like a dreamer, and then he added, we should drink red wine. I tried not to laugh. I would never heard such jokes from my pediatric patient, so I asked him politely if I may see the reference to drinking red wine in case of radiation emergency, which is, he mentioned, was in the protocol. And his answer shocked me. After the accident, he whispered, the corresponding part of that manual was removed. I stopped this conversation, but his answer continued to bother me. So after work, I went to my parents' apartment. I wanted to mobilize three generations of my family to go to the grocery store and to buy as many cases of red wine as uh, my family members can carry. We entered the grocery store and were stunned to find empty wine shelves staring back at us. This was a further proof that rumors spread as fast as radiation. Fast forward, currently scientists in the US are investigating a component called resveratrol, which is present in red wine. If approved as a drug, it might protect human cells from harmful effects of radiation. My studies demonstrated the protective effect of resveratrol against radiation-induced intestinal injury, which is a potential cause against high-dose radiation exposure, is working or effective. However, according to the developers of this product, someone have to drink 720 bottles of wine to match the results of the compound that they created. And it is clear by the time someone drank that much wine, no, they wouldn't worry about radiation anymore. So we definitely need more information on resveratrol 
in radiation protection, but red wine certainly improved doctor-patient communication. In summary, for years, I received this question on all the meetings, many international meetings, what was the most unexpected for us? And my answer never changed because I said everything was unexpected. But now I can be more specific that lots of things that we did not expect pertain to skin injuries, the diversity of clinical manifestation of skin injuries, and a custom course of clinical phases of radiation skin injury, also significant severity of injuries, and serious influence of skin burns on morbidity and mortality, and that surgical intervention is required at an early stage of radiation, especially severe radiation burn. Some insights gained from Chernobyl. I will just read off slides because it took me, well, 30 years to put it together so I can read. Maximize knowledge, experience, and preparedness of healthcare providers. Health-related information should come from scientists and medical personnel who must be equipped with practical tools for identifying and assessing radiation victims. Conflicting information should be avoided. We should develop criteria for medical personnel on decision-making prior to the event. Situation should be explained to population in plain language. Gathering information on exposure characteristics. We need to know the dose, duration of exposure, and whether the patient had some shielding. This also will be important for dose assessment and treatment. Safety culture at the radiation nuclear facilities require constant assessment and maintenance to prevent the equipment from malfunction and to prevent human errors. Very important is international collaboration and information sharing among the organizations and individual experts. I will skip the six month time period during my family and I traveled as refugees from the former Soviet Union through Austria and Italy to the United States. In the United States, I continued my job as a pediatric hematologist oncologist. However, after September 11, my career changed. I joined the Division of Counterterrorism at the FDA. Created in 2002, Division had a specific role to make sure that public and healthcare community have timely access to products that could be used as medical countermeasures in the event of nuclear, biological, chemical threat, or natural disasters. This job was a fulfillment of my dream, the dream that I carried from the days of Chernobyl, how to protect people from accidental and intentional radiation exposure. Over the years, the name of the division underwent a few changes. The current name is Counterterrorism and Emergency Coordination Staff, but its unique role remained the same. In 2006, the International 
conference dedicated to 20th Chernobyl accident titled 20 years after Chernobyl's future outlook was held in Kyiv. And uh, the presentation and presentation and discussions took place at the National Opera Theater in Ukraine, which is regarded the most beautiful, magnificent building in the country. I was invited to that meeting where on behalf of the FDA, I presented medical countermeasure development under the animal rule. At that time, it was a novel approach to the advancing of medication for large populations exposed to high doses of radiation from accidental as well as from nuclear terrorist attack. New concept of acute radiation syndrome. And I put underneath not known in 1986. Again, today is a very, this approach that we accept with multiple organ failure, multiple organ dysfunction, but at that time it was a novel approach. And this slide is a courtesy of Dr. Patrick Gunmelan, a professor of the Institute of Radiation and Safety in Paris. At that meeting in Kyiv, Dr. Gurmelan presented this slide and he received an award for the best presentation on acute radiation syndrome management review of modern approaches. This slide refers to the radioprotectant that I mentioned was used during Chernobyl disaster, Indralin, that was an experimental drug at that time. It also underwent some significant changes as a molecule, as a drug, the new testing. And today, Indralin is approved by Russian Federation as one of the radioprotectants. So, the indication is designed to prevent acute radiation injuries and to reduce the risk of death from exposure to high dose rate of radiation. Radioprotective effects of indralin was validated in experiments with in seven animal species. FDA, American FDA would be really happy with this number. And it included dogs and monkeys. The action of indralin, the properties attribute to direct interaction with alpha-1 adrenergic agonist, which makes the blood vessels to constrict. Constricted blood vessels, less flow, the organism undergoes through stage of hypoxia and hypoxia stage, any human being or a animal in the stage of hypoxia is more resistant to radiation. So it can be repeated the maximum reaches its maximum effects in 10, 15 minutes if necessary, if the exposure continues intralin could be repeated in one hour. And I will end my presentation here. And this last slide, I will use as a link to our second meeting in April. This will help emphasize the significance of development of having radio protectors and pathways for their developing. On the thank you slide, I would like to thank Cassandra Carlson for her multiple and very patient communications with me. Thank you to the skilled and enthusiastic moderator Manuela. And I would like to praise Beth Karina for her artistic slide designer skills. And I would like to thank everybody 
for listening to my stories and uh, I am ready for questions. Thank you so much for these very intense and emotional story that, that you told us. And I have already a few questions for you, but please, everybody's very welcome to ask uh, questions. Of course, as Italian, I have to ask you about the red wine. <laughs> you might be surprised, somebody might, might like to, to drink 720 bottles of wine. <laughs> So, yeah, I look forward to, to learn more about the resveratrol. Uh, as an, They say it's an antioxidant, right? Right. That might right. help. Um, so, uh, this, um, what you said about the red wine reminded me of, of the, what people were saying when the pandemic started, the coronavirus pandemic. Everybody was drinking tonic water because it was with cleaning. And then, uh, you know, this uh, disaster that you were, the, the crisis that you were explaining just reminded me a little bit of the, 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 the preparedness of the medical, um, uh, you know, people that during this pandemic was, was a very big crisis as well. Do you see any um, um, kind of, I don't know, this crisis that we are living now, does remind you some, somehow of what you felt or what you witnessed in, uh, during the Chernobyl disaster? Um, yes, um, absolutely. It's, it was amazing from day one for, uh, in this COVID crisis, of course, it's not my area of expertise. And I was just bystander and was listening to the information which changed so quickly that this was fearful and confusing. The similarities, I will just mentioned few similarities that I I noticed between these two disasters. Definitely not preparedness. And why is this happening? I can see few ways why it's uh, medical personnel never received, I'm talking now in the US, never received their training radiation protection or how to distinguish radiation burns from thermal burns. Anything that's related to radiation was never mentioned neither in my, during my residency, three years at Georgetown, not, not a single time. And then when I was doing my fellowship in clinical hematology oncology at NIH, Radiation was only mentioned as a treatment modality, but nothing else. So neither medical personnel nor general population had no knowledge about that. And if you don't have knowledge, then you're not prepared. The difference, there are much more, but I just wanna, don't wanna take a lot of time and address two differences that struck me. In the former Soviet Union with Chernobyl disaster, we had zero information for weeks, zero information, and then false information for months. Just no word whatsoever. With COVID, it was a different and also not something that uh, helpful. The information was for the public, but it changed so frequently, literally two, three times a day, or even three, four, every three, four hours. What do you do with the packages? So you keep them for three days. Don't touch your Amazon package for three days. Then don't touch it for three hours. Oh no, then okay, you can, you can open it and other things, and uh, we are better, but it's been a year since uh, this started and we still 
don't have the clarity that we would like to have. The thing that struck me in Chernobyl, the Soviet government did not want any help, did not want any advice from the international community. I know that American and Japanese offered their help from first days and weeks and Soviet and Ukrainian government denied the help. Later on, they agreed to have buses and boxes and trains with the equipment that came from uh, United States, but there were no support from anywhere. Ukraine and Belarus were in such an isolation from any other republic, from any other countries. And I see it as a positive sign here, at least we use now the word solidarity, meaning that we are relying on international experience, which is, which is I think is a very positive move forward. Pierre is asking something like a bit related to what we were just talking about. Sure. You know, he was asking, there was the disaster of Chernobyl and then the Fukushima accident. And then he says that those accidents, even the Fukushima, show that Occidental countries uh, were not fully prepared to face any nuclear accident. Do you feel, in your opinion, do you think that in 2021, our society will be ready to face such tragedies again? I'm not sure. The only thing I am sure that new disaster will come. We don't know when and what kind of disaster. I have to be pessimistic because this is a, this history that presents this way, but whether we're going to be prepared, I don't know. If we don't have, if nobody teaches us what to do as a public, as a medical personnel, we don't know what to do. There is no intuitive feeling. There is no something that we can rely, which is inside of us that we can deal with the disaster. We need knowledge. I know that people don't like the word education, so I try not to use it, but, or lessons learned, but we have to, to learn more about the possibility of upcoming catastrophic event. And we need to analyze very, very carefully what already happened these are priceless evidence that we have. You mentioned Fukushima. And before I mentioned how positive the evacuation could be for people, they're evacuated from the contaminated area, they're in safe place. But Fukushima, especially with evacuation of elderly and sick people showed opposite results people who were, let's say, in the nursing homes or at the hospitals, elderly people in particular, they were evacuated to the places where nobody could visit them, where nobody could reach them. Again, maybe it was not the best planning, maybe they were, it's good as a step that they were evacuated, but then so many of them died the death toll from this in this evacuees group was high. And these are, you know, reflected in in literature. Yeah. So there is another question asking what were the longitudinal effects on children from radiation? So assuming some have had children at that point. Had there been trends in miscarriage or birth defects or low birth weight, et cetera? Yeah, well, I was planning to give the full summary in details my next presentation, but of course I'll be happy to give a quick summary for, for this. 
So there, all the pregnant women, without exception, in Ukraine, and by the way, in European countries, such as uh, Norway, all Scandinavian countries, doctors offered abortions. Not very aggressively in Scandinavian countries, but very aggressively in Ukraine. And women, again, without having any knowledge what radiation could do to the fetus. At that time, nobody knew that if, the, if women in her four to six weeks of pregnancy, this is the least vulnerable stage of the embryo. Next eight, I believe, to 12 weeks of pregnancy is where some malformation can occur. And 12 weeks to third trimester, the IQ in children could be lower, some skills also could be malformation, miscarriages, that was first, first, sorry, first couple of weeks, miscarriages were mm, typical, but nobody knew that. So when the doctor said abortion, all women comply, but those who did not, then they were the analysis still, there is no one answer is inconsistent. What as of 34 years ago, I will be reviewing literature by next seminar, 35 years, but as 30, 33, these data were inconsistent. Some would say that there is absolutely no negative effects on children in their development who were embryos at that time and other also credible research would say, no, they have low IQ, they're more aggressive, they're more prone to depression. So again, I'll try to get, if it exists, more concrete information. We, we all look forward to that as well. Thank so you. There is another question that I want to ask you. Somebody uh, has, um, the design of the reactor was very poor, especially mm -hmm. in terms of the lack of a protective outer shell. I believe uh, several similar reactors were built. Has any remedial action been taken to improve the safety of these reactions, uh, reactors as far as we you know? Well, um, this, I know more about this reactor. I didn't follow the future reactors, but this was the design that Nobel Prize laureate was uh, assessing as flaw for many reasons. It's first that it was located, it was built on the place where ground, the soil was not very, you know, stable. It was a subject to rock if some uh, hurricanes or heavy rains. Also the reactor rods, there was no boxes that would contain the radioactive materials if they inside, if for any reasons they were concentrated like during the accident inside the reactor. There was no such. And this is what is the human error in this case. People knew that there is no such and still they closed, they cut all the external safety measures to conduct the experiment and the experiment was designed, let's see how reactor works on the internal energy if all the supply from outside is cut. So these steps were absolutely inconsistent with what they did. Plus there were lots of rods, uh, graphite rods in this reactor is my also 
understanding and recollection and rods supposed to absorb the neutron that would come during the explosion and also contain them. And this didn't happen, but I'm pretty sure that more technical person than I, or I can make a little presentation about reactor flaws for next time. Ella, I want to thank you really on behalf of so many attendees writing that appreciated so much your, your presentation and uh, all uh, sharing with us all your vivid mem memories. So thank you all the participants for being with us and thank you Dr. Shapiro for taking the time and we really look forward to, to, to the science the next time. Is there anything that you want to say? I just immensely grateful to you that you, again, you invited me to be a speaker and I am grateful to everybody who came and um, unfortunately I cannot see anybody <laughs> from the audience, but I can imagine few people who told me that they will be there and uh, but I really thankful to all of you and uh, I'll try to get well prepared for the next seminar which would be Chernobyl 35 years after and I have my own story how the bone marrow sparing probably could fit into the question. So at uh, this miraculous or rather <laughs> mysteri mysterious note, I will stop. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Cassandra, I'll, I'll pass it to you now. Thank you, ladies. If you guys enjoyed this, yeah, stay tuned for this April 23rd for part two. And Dr. Shapiro will dive more into the data side of Chernobyl. At the beginning, when we started planning this, one of the panelists asked to focus on cancer after Chernobyl. If it's still one of the most interesting topic then, or part of the presentation, of course, I'll be happy But if there are, to address that. But if there are some other wishes, hopes, please, we have time, let me know if people interested not only in cancers, rays or incidents. I think psychological is a very interesting and since it's also tied to current disaster, maybe I will just spend some time talking about that. Sounds great. I think um, whatever you bring to the table is gonna be wonderful. And um, everyone is very engaged and appreciative for this. So thank you. And attendees, please stay tuned next week. I will send you an email with links, the links that were in her presentation, as well as how you can be register for the upcoming part two. Thank you. Thank you all.